The meeting of the Faculty Senate will come to order. Welcome everyone, we've achieved a quorum, so hey, at least I'm not messing up right off the bat. Um, if you haven't already checked in, please do check in with the Seaboard mobile ID system. Uh, we are trying to move to that as opposed to the physical check-ins, although if you're having trouble, uh, you're welcome to see the folks out in the hallway and they'll help you uh, come on in. Uh, for our colleagues connecting from a distance, uh, we hope that we think the system's all up and working pretty well now, so please begin your responses with Potomac State or WVU Tech. If I might ask at this point, Potomac, uh, WVU Tech, uh, how many are present? WVU Tech has three senators present. Thank you, ma'am. And Potomac State, how many are present? Uh, Potomac State has two senators present. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, as part of my learning to do this job, I've forgotten a brief agenda item for today, so I'll be adding an agenda item. It's just a short one after number eight on the list, the GEF committee report. I had asked the chairs of the committees to stand up and briefly introduce themselves as well as what their committees do, just so the new senators can kind of see what's going on and we can remind ourselves what the committees do here. So I'll be adding that item. It won't take a lot of time. Uh, I've already asked the chairs to do that and it was my mistake to leave it off the agenda. So first item of business for approval, the minutes of the June 11th Faculty Senate meeting. The minutes of the previous meeting have been distributed as an annex to your uh, agenda. Are there any additions or corrections to the minutes from the June meeting? Hearing no corrections, the minutes are approved as written. Now, my privilege to, for the first, first time, introduce our president, Gordon Gates. So, uh, listen, everyone, this is uh, David's first time. He's, uh, you don't seem to be very nervous, as a matter of fact. You seem to be full of, uh, uh, we've, I've been blessed in my nearly five years here to have uh, remarkable chairs of our faculty senate, and David continues in that tradition. So, David, welcome to the chair, and uh, welcome to the opportunity to work with you. So, uh, and welcome all of you. It's a rainy day. It's Hurricane Gordon out there. Uh, and I don't know if any, is anyone named Florence here? I don't know if there's anyone named Florence, but that one is coming too. So, um, it's been some time since I've been able to be with all of you. Uh, uh, the, the prevailing circumstances and uh, in a lot of travel, which I think everyone is doing, but I'm, I'm pleased to say that it's great to have our academic year uh, started and we are off to an excellent chart, uh, start. We have uh, 6,650 new students um, uh, spread across our three campuses, which uh, continues to be good news for us. Uh, Beckley continues to grow at a, at a clip uh, where uh, our other two institutions here and. Uh, and at, uh, and at Potomac State, we're, we're a little flat, but um, we intend on getting our retention rates up, and obviously uh, we have a great admissions process itself. Um, but the thing that I think is more important is that um, when I came some four, four and a half years ago, we had 300 uh, honor students. We built a residence hall and 300 of them could get in there and that was just about what it was. We have now, the official number is 1,020 honor students. And uh, the thing that's even more important is the fact that uh, we substantially raised the, uh, uh, the requirements for being an honor student. So raise the requirements, attract more people, uh, more honor students here. Uh, our goal was to have 20% of our class be honor students and they are, we now have reached that goal. So. I cannot be more pleased about that, and that's a promising sign um, of our efforts to continue to transfer our, uh, uh, the academic uh, culture of our campus and the opportunities we have. So I've been playing chess. I've been playing chess with the state. I've been playing chess with Hepsi. I've been playing chess with almost everyone, um, and I might talk a little bit about that. As you know, uh, our governor did, did create a Blue Ribbon Commission on the future of higher education, uh, particularly the four-year institutions in this state. Uh, the purpose of that is the fact that uh, we have not really taken a look at uh, the structure of higher education in uh, West Virginia for a long period of time. Um, and uh, some of that was also preci precipitated by the fact that uh, the Higher Education Policy Commission has not been looked at for a long period of time uh, as to what, uh, what its role and function should be. 
and the role of the uh, and the role of four-year institutions vis-a-vis -vis the community and technical colleges. Uh, we are now in the middle of that. Uh, we hope to have a series of recommendations uh, ready for uh, legislative action and gubernatorial support uh, by uh, by the middle of November. Um, and I, I just want to sort of outline to you because I've done it publicly several times where where I view where we are right now in terms of higher education. First of all, I think our system is broken. Uh, I think that we have uh, a higher education system that uh, is uh, is not rewarding of, uh, of efforts, of performance, of a number of other things, and I think we need to address that. Secondly of all, I think that we are over-bureaucratized dramatically, um, and we have a higher education policy commission, good people, not doing necessarily the kind of things that should be done, because uh, I can tell you they have they have 80, 84 people, a budget of $12.5 million, a substantially larger budget than the central administration of this university. So that in and of itself uh, is, is a problem. Uh, the third thing, of course, is the fact that, they, that there has been a funding, per, uh, funding um, a proposal put forward, um, which takes money away from the university to to uh, to designate it for other institutions. Now, this is the first time in my 38 years of experience I've ever had any kind of funding formula put forward that takes money away from the flagship institution. It uh, is strange to say the least. So I I think that where we ought to end up, and uh, and I can say this publicly because even though I chair the chair the commission, that uh, I think we need to have three things. One is we need to have a a governance structure um, which allows the local boards of the institution to uh, be in charge of that institution. I think a strong uh, board of governors is in the best interest of, uh, of all of higher education in the state. Secondly of all, uh, I think that uh, we need to have uh, a policy commission which is really um, greatly pared down to provide service functions for those smaller institutions that need to have them, um, and uh, that it would not act in a policy role, but rather in a service function role. I think that, uh, I think that the head of, uh, of the policy commission should be an executive director, probably reporting to the governor, and uh, be a part of the governor's cabinet, but certainly not an independent uh, governance structure. The third thing is the fact that ultimately, uh, we need to um, we need to realize that all of higher education in this state is dramatically underfunded, and we need to come up with a way to recognize that. Um, for the first time in my time here at the institution, um, we actually have a surplus in state government uh, dollars, uh, thirty million dollar surplus last month, a thirty million dollar surplus this month. We Apparently, uh, we hopefully are on a on a much better economic um, road, and because of that, I think that what we need to do is we need to um, seek restoration of funding that has been removed from universities and colleges over the past uh, four years. Our own institution alone has has uh, provided 20, uh, forty million dollars in terms of, uh, of money returned to the state, uh, and. Um, one of the things I felt very strongly about and that I had received considerable, um, considerable support for was that once we, once we had sufficient dollars uh, at least uh, starting to come in, that the restoration of funding would occur, and I think, that, I think that we will make that case. In the meantime, I think that we need to have a funding formula that recognizes the fact that there are, there are some institutions, the small regional institutions that are, are underfunded, and that we need to try to right-size that uh, initially uh, with a $10 million infusion into state funding for higher education. Uh, that could well go um, toward uh, uh, solving some of those ills. But then we need to have a long-term funding formula that recognizes three things. Differentiation. Um, the, the, this institution is, a, uh, with all told, with all of its uh, faculty, staff, students, and its academic medical center is a three and a half billion dollar organization, uh, approaching four billion, uh, which is about the same size as the state budget. Uh, and so we're a very complex institution, and it's very difficult to recognize uh, 
the difference between a very complex university um, and a um, and a smaller institution. Uh, Concord University is about a thirty-eight million dollar institution, for example, and so to compare uh, to compare apples to apples is just not uh, is not uh, ultimately what needs to be done. So differentiation. Secondly, of all, we institutions need to be rewarded. I've, I've chaired two funding commissions: one for Colorado uh, when I was president there, and one for Ohio State when I was and for Ohio when I was president there. Both times. <laughs> The, the elements of, uh, of, a, of, a, of a solid funding proposal are one, uh, differentiation, two, performance. Um, so if you are performing well, you should be rewarded for that. If your graduation rates are going up, if the quality of your classes are going up, if your retention rates are going up, one of the things that I find most distressing about where we are in this state right now is reward people for having people in seats and not having people complete. Um, the, uh, you know, so very often what happens is someone will just say, y'all come, that's kind of an admission process, y'all come, sit in here for two weeks, we'll count you and then goodbye. Um, that is a formula for uh, mediocrity and, and in fact a formula for disaster. So, so we are going to uh, focus very much on uh, Making the case for higher education is not simply about West Virginia University. We are the flagship institution. We do have a substantial stake in this. Uh, we do have an opportunity, I think, to uh, take a leadership role, and we will do that. The second thing, the second chess match is, of course, with uh, improving the quality of Greek life on this campus. I was, uh, I was telling our, our, uh, our student leaders uh, not long ago, I attended recently a uh, a function of 60, 61 public university presidents, I was the only one who raised my hand in support of a, um, of a vital uh, a fraternity and sorority system, and I continue to, uh, I continue to believe that that is necessary. Um, and, uh, but it has to be one in which uh, there is uh, a high level of expectation of performance. And we went through this process last uh, spring of, creating um, a, 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 a reaching the summit approach, which was raising the standards, raising the expectations, having people uh, live by it. The sororities did very well. Uh, the vast majority of the fraternities did very well. There have been some who've been out of line and uh, some who declared that they wanted to be independent from the university. And um, I simply do not believe that that's in the best interest. I did send a note to every parent of every incoming freshman saying that we would not, ex that we would not uh, endorse that nor, um, nor believe that that is in the best interest of, uh, of the university. And so um, we're in that process of, uh, of taking, um, taking measure of where we are with our fraternities and sororities, but I have, uh, I have high hopes this year. Um, uh, just a couple of other points. The provost will talk really about hiring and some of the, uh, some of the changes we've made there, but I just want to note that um, for the fourth consecutive year, the annual giving uh, program of our university saw a um, significant increase. We uh, raised $161 million. Uh, we raised $1.25 billion. Um, our goal is to be at about $200 million a year uh, as quickly as we possibly can. The reason I say that is the fact that um, if the state is an unreliable partner, our um, our donors need to be the most reliable of partners, and so we are, we're working very hard to make that happen. Saying that, are there any questions I can answer any of you? Uh, I took more time than I should, David, and I apologize for that. Any questions I can answer for any of you? Seeing or hearing none, uh, I turn it back to you, David. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Okay, uh, and now I'd be happy to invite Provost McConnell to come up and give some remarks too. Hi, David. You? Welcome to Thank the role. You. <laughs> you already feel like you've been in it. Yes. <laughs> well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's wonderful to see you all here. Sorry about the weather. Um, you know, we can't do anything about it, unfortunately. It is, it is Tropical Storm Gordon, but uh, that's the, so that's his fault. Um, 
<laughs> Tropical Storm Gordon converging with Florence, I think, is, is what's going on. Um, it, it, for those of you who are interested in athletics, I will share with you, because I don't think Shane is here today, um, that there's a lot of back and forth going on about whether the game will actually be played in North Carolina because of the storm. As soon as we hear anything, we'll let you all know. Um, I, I did send him a text and tell him we would do everything we could possibly do to accommodate um, him and the athletes, but I, I really don't know what's going on at this point. Hopefully, once we know a little bit more about the trajectory of the storm, uh, we'll know. Um, I wanted to thank you all uh, for your interest in Campus we Read. Um, this is the third year we've done it, and we've been getting sort of tremendous excitement about Campus Read, and particularly um, this year's Station 11. I don't know how many of you have had a chance to read it or are using it in your class, um, but I'm a person who avoids dystopian literature. Um, you can probably tell, since I'm one of these incredible optimists, that reading dystopian literature is just doesn't fit within my world view. But um, I highly recommend it. It really is about what lifts the human spirit. And I think it's a, a wonderful read. So I, I hope you'll participate with us. Um, the author, which is this wonderfully talented young woman named Emily St. Mandel, St. John Mandel, is coming at 7.30 p.m. on Wednesday at the Clay Theater on September 19th. Um, so please put that on your calendar. I think it's going to be quite extraordinary, and I think it'll be wonderful for our students because she's closer in, to their age than she is to ours, and um, it's, it will be wonderful to host her. In addition, you may not realize there's actually a Campus Read website, and you can get on there and see all the activities that are going on all across campus, um, around Campus Read, and there's a lot. So I encourage you to take a look at that. Not that you're ever short on something to do, but um, if it's something you're interested in, I'd really love to see you do that. Um, one, of, one of the great things that happens um, when something goes wrong on the campus is my email explodes. So um, I got a lot of explosive emails about the PRT, um, <laughs> as you might imagine. Um, one just started, I'm not even going to ask you for your forgiveness for my rant, and then went on from there. Um, <laughs> um, but I try, I try to open these with good humor, um, because what I, I think you may not know um, is, and, and this person had actually gone on and said, do something about it, invest some money in this, rather than advising. Well, we have invested a lot of money in it. We've been investing $40 million to upgrade 1970s technology. Um, so we've invested a lot. We've hired a very good firm. They've been working very hard on it. Um, you probably know that given the age of it, almost everything we do has to be um, self-created um, by us. So we're trying to find systems that allow us to get out from under that. Um, we did send an email out to all faculty on the 15th of August, I don't know if you actually received it, asking you to um, cons be considerate of the students because particularly our freshmen were very upset about it, uh, be upset about being late. You know, if you wait another couple weeks, they won't be. Um, but the first few weeks, they were a little bit nervous about it. Um, additional buses are now being run to accommodate. I know buses aren't as good as the PRT, but it's what we can do at this point to patch it together. The transportation office did actually rise to the occasion and tried to did study student ridership patterns in bus stops for the first week of classes and generated a schedule that adapted to student needs. Um, and so um, what, what they were able to do in that first week has made things a little bit better, and we hope that they'll continue to get better. Um, did all of you receive the email about the PRT, just as a check-in to make sure things are working? Um, so that um, the, the bus shuttle backup for the PRT was updated August 22nd. Um, and so now there's more frequent shuttle stops at places where we knew students were having trouble. Um, so hopefully uh, that will solve some of our problems. Has it gotten better, worse? 
Not better. I see the no, not better. Worse? No. Well, okay. Maybe, maybe the buses will help then a little bit. Um, if you have some uh, helpful information like bus stops that you think are being missed or students are telling you consistently they wait at a certain place, and please let us know so we can get that information uh, back to transportation. Students tend not to think about that. In addition, there, if you don't realize this, there is a public transportation app, and stu students can actually access the app, and that can be very helpful um, as well if you just pass that along. Um, in terms of uh, some reorganization of my office, I thought that would be worth um, just talking about for a minute. So um, many of you recognize that I lost some staff in the spring, and um, that gave me a wonderful opportunity to rethink how it is the provost's office operates and who we have in charge of what. Um, that combined with a very critical need for us to up our focus on retention. You probably remember I've been talking about retention every time we talk, um, and we've done a tremendous amount over the last three years to reconfigure structures, um, get, get information and support to our students, but we think we need to do more. Um, John Campbell, who's the vice pro one of our vice provosts, is actually a national expert in retention, particularly the place where you can use sophisticated technology to help you uh, with retention of students. But what you're going to be hearing a lot more about is what can we all be doing um, around retention, whether it's in the classroom, um, in our offices, um, or any other way in which we can increase our retention numbers. As all of you know, our budget is so dependent on students, so this is a, a happy convergence of goals. We want our students to be successful, and we want to have a firmer foundation in our budget, and if we can meet the one goal, we can create that firmer foundation. So that's a, a great, great opportunity for us. Um, in addition, in that reorganization, so I moved John Campbell to focus on retention, and he has many people reporting to him in that portfolio. Um, I moved uh, Paul Kreider, who is here today, and he's going to give you a few announcements as well. Uh, Paul is now a vice provost, and he has all of undergraduate education and the deans reporting to him to me. And then we brought over Mark Gavin, a, an associate of many of you from the College of Business and Economics, to focus on facilities and budget and that sort of thing. So we were able to reconfigure without adding anyone to the provost's office, but I think it makes it um, more possible, uh, gives us a greater possibility of meeting the goals that we need to meet. Um, so I'm happy to announce that. The, uh, I have some other good news that I'll go through really quickly. Oh, Festival of Ideas. I know a lot of people want to talk about Festival of Ideas, so I just want to tell you um, how much we appreciate all of you reaching out, those of you who signed a petition. Um, we really appreciate you being on top of it, reminding us, um, and not um, letting us forget our obligation to diversity and inclusion. So um, as you know, Festival Ideas is um, actually something that was started by David Hardesty when he was actually student government president. Um, the history of it has been that it always runs out of the president's office. Um, and we are working very closely with the president's office, as is Misha Poor, who is our vice president for diversity, equity, and inclusion. And going forward, uh, Misha ha is coordinating some town hall conversations um, and we're giving great thought to other ways that we can go about um, structuring and identifying our guests for Festival of Ideas. One of the questions, in addition to diversity, that people ask about um, uh, Festival of Ideas is how is it funded? Don't we have a lot of funding? And one of the questions is always, why don't we have higher reputation speakers? Um, and the answer is, we only have $100,000 dedicated to the Festival of Ideas, um, and some of the high-level um, 
uh, speakers that people will recommend to us are, are easily between 100,000 and 200,000 just for one. And so we, we don't feel like that is the best use of our resources um, as we've gone through these budget challenges. So we've been trying to uh, work um, to put together the Festival of Ideas without bringing in the top of the top uh, named people. But for example, um, one of the uh, wonderful things right now that we've discovered and, and why you bringing this to our attention was so important is that the, um, by going through and looking at all of the speakers that are speaking around campus and others that would be um, rise to the level of festival, we ended up greatly diversifying the group. Uh, so if you get on the website, you'll see a much more diverse group now. Um, good news, should I go real fast? Um, good news, um, CPAS is Dana Volker, received a very important national award, the Dorothy V. Harris Memorial Award from the Association for Applied Sports Psychology. Um, Ann Chester received something called PACEM, which is the President's Award for Excellence in Science, Math, and Engineering Mentoring, and that was for her, the HISTA program that she's been running for so many years for high school students from West Virginia. Karsten Millsman received a National Science Foundation Award um, for Chemistry. Um, and that's a really, whenever someone uh, receives a career award, we all want to celebrate. That's an incredible thing. Um, and Gay Stewart um, was given another foundation award from the National Science Foundation for the first two alliance. And it, as many of you know, Gay Stewart is the director of our WVU Center for Excellence in STEM Education. Um, so we're really, really pleased uh, at the successes of our faculty. I'm gonna turn it, before we ask for questions from the other two campuses and from the campus here, I'm gonna ask Paul to give you a few updates as well. I think I wanna have Paul and John Campbell occasionally come up and present to you, um, and CB, of course, um, you know, has done in the past. I wanna make sure that all of you know who's in the provost's office so that you can put a face to a name and feel comfortable reaching out to us. Did you know of one? Right. Oh, okay. Well, let's... Oh. Good afternoon. So as the provost mentioned, um, the university is very dependent upon the, the, uh, the tuition bills of students, and that also means they need to pay their bills. So this uh, spring, you may remember that we did a soft drop of students who had unpaid tuition bills, and then we did a harder process this fall semester. I wanted to just uh, briefly give you an update on, on how that rolled out. So this fall, we did a drop of students who had a tuition bills of $1,000 or more. And to give you an idea of what that looked like, on August 27th, there were 2,257 students who owed $1,000 or more to the institution. That amounted to $29.2 million. And then we uh, had a lot of communication that went out to all the students and families. And on September 4th, students were dropped, okay, from their classes. And the number of students that were, that were dropped at that time was 887 students. So we had significantly 1,500, roughly 1,500 students who paid from August 27th up to that drop date. That, that um, the amount on September 4th was $9.2 million. So basically, in a little over a week's time, we, we gleaned $20 million in unpaid bills. We dropped the students. Um, they had three days, basically, to pay or enter a payment plan and get reinstated. Um, we had, uh, as of the end of the day, Friday, 61% 61 61 of the students who were dropped across all campuses were reinstated. And for Morgantown, that was 65%. So we are now basically, there were 345 students dropped as there was at the end of last week, uh, or not reinstated, I should say. And uh, that resulted in $2.9 million. So the difference between 29 million back in late August to, to today is a huge difference. So um, I, I know there's always, there are always a few uh, gnashing of teeth from students and parents uh, 
when they have issues, we've tried to accommodate issues, we've tried to work with them, provide more, more federal aid when possible, or loans, or even institutional aid when it's, when it's feasible. Obviously, there are some students who are at risk, and we look at all sorts of criteria to get them back in class. But I think we did a pretty great job. The hub owes our thanks and congratulations for all the work that they did over the last week. I wanted to also mention the academic leadership fellows that are with us this year in the provost's office. Um, Joshua Hall from Economics is working on strategic budget planning. Nicole Infante from Mathematics is working on DFW rates. Allison Dagan from Literary Ed is working in graduate affairs this year. Rhonda Raymond from Art History is working on Project 168. Uh, Kristen Schaup in Accounting is working with the Provost on Strategic Planning, as is Matthew Smith's, Smith from uh, Neurocritical Care, and Judith Wasserman from Landscape Architecture. Working in Transfer is Evan Witters again this year, and Tricia Phillips from Political Science is working in Academic Integrity. So we are also accepting applications for the Fellows Program for the next academic year, 1920. Uh, you can go to the faculty website to apply and, or contact, contact Chris Staples in the Provost's office for more information. My last item here is uh, basically I wanted to just alert you that in 2010, WVU received a Carnegie Foundation Community Engaged University status, and we are going up for renewal for that. We have to apply in spring of, of 19. So uh, we are having a, a uh, internet session, interest session, excuse me, on September 11th, which is tomorrow, from 1 till 2, and that's in the Shenandoah room. If you want to learn more information about that process or get involved, uh, please do so. This is, again, about service learning, civic engagement is what that award is about. Any questions for me at this time? Any questions from Potomac State? Any questions from w WVU Tech? Any questions for the Provost? Thank you very much. Thanks, sir. Okay, well, uh, uh, my remarks now, uh, I'll try to keep them brief. Uh, welcome back. Uh, thank you all for participating in the Senate. We literally couldn't do this without you, so we certainly appreciate your uh, attendance here. It's also at this point uh, difficult for me to note that uh, Chad Proudfoot, our longstanding member of the Senate who's helped out in a number of different ways over the years, uh, is moving on to greener pastures in other places. He presently is both the Senate parliamentarian and the faculty secretary. We will need to replace both of those positions, the individuals in both those positions. Uh, although given what Chad has done, uh, he's going to be very difficult to replace. Uh, I'll have some updates. We'll talk about this in exec, and then I'll bring some, forward, uh, some stuff forward here to Senate to talk about how we're going to, to move forward to do this. Uh, in response to some desperate pleadings, I've been able to convince Marjorie McDermott to come over from law and help out with some of the parliamentary questions. So uh, uh, hopefully she'll kick me gently when I make some errors here. Um, okay, and I'll, uh, I'll put a longer term item on your agenda. One of our senators, uh, Gretchen Garofoli, has offered to facilitate flu prevention shots. So both before and after the November Senate meeting, we will have sort of a flu prevention clinic here. Uh, uh, she assures me that this is free for folks in PEIA, and I think almost everybody here is in PEIA if you're employed by the university. So you'll need to bring your PEIA insurance card, and if you're interested in getting a flu shot, we will have those available at the November meeting. So not the next one, but November. But this is, a, I think, a good way for us to, to, to do this, uh, and, and hopefully we'll get some good results from this as well. Uh, um, a minor issue with uh, eCampus that has come up in previous Senate meetings. Uh, we've had discussion of when eCampus should be open uh, for faculty to provide uh, information for their students. Uh, and there was discussion about whether it should on, you know, only op open on the day the classes start or whether faculty can put it up ahead of time. Uh, it's worth noting, you probably got an email about this, uh, that the, the, the ITS people have managed to get eCampus uh, to work in a variable rate, so faculty can now choose how early they want eCampus to open up. So you can choose to have it open on the first day, you can choose to have it open up to a week ahead of time, but those are settings that you control in eCampus uh, as you see fit. Um, 
Uh, finally, uh, we're working with uh, C.B. Wilson's office uh, to look for volunteers for the University Promotion and Tenure Advisory Board. Uh, the University Promotion and, and Tenure Advisory Panel helps advise the provost on cases of promotion and or tenure at uh, WVU. Last year we had roughly 150 cases of promotion and or tenure that rose up from the units and the colleges uh, to be reviewed in, in the provost's office. Uh, we're looking for at least 10 faculty members who will serve in roughly March and April uh, reviewing those cases uh, and making recommendations to the provost. Uh, if anyone is interested in serving on this panel, please uh, email me and I'll be happy to put you in touch with the folks in C.B. Wilson's office. Uh, um, note that uh, anyone of any rank from any of the campuses is welcome to serve. The only restriction is that if you're presently serving on a department level or college level P&T board, you cannot also serve on the university board. But if you're not, uh, we're welcome to, to have you along and, and it's a worthwhile experience. I've done it myself for a couple of years and it was really interesting to see the high quality of the folks uh, going up for promotion and tenure here. Uh, that's it for me. Uh, anyone have any questions for me? I'm new at this, so please don't ask any. <laughs> okay, so then it's my pleasure to see if Krista Board will come up and discuss a little bit of the more recent culture survey. We get, should come up here pretty quick. There we go. There go. Excellent, well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, we're entering into our year three now around trying to shape our culture. And so what I'd like to talk about just a little bit is level set a, a little bit around culture in this initiative and then kind of tell you where we're trying to go with it. So, um, you know, a couple of years ago as a leadership team, we talked about the concept of can you uh, shape your culture or just, is culture something that just happens and there's nothing you can really do about it. And you know, collectively, uh, particularly after doing the research and uh, talking with a, a firm named Sen Delaney that we've spent some time with, we, we've come to the conclusion that you absolutely can shape your culture. If you don't, it will happen anyway, uh, but you're, you're much better off to try to shape it than you are to just react to it and let it occur. But if you think about historically where we've been, our culture right now, the one we live with, is largely a product of what's just happened as opposed to what we've tried to consciously shape. And why we think that's important, and I think you all would agree with this, that uh, I'm trying to find that, there we go. No, I'm going the wrong direction. It should be a lead-in slide, I'm missing it, so I'm just gonna speak to it. Um, if you have a strong culture, it accelerates what you're trying to accomplish. It accelerates, for our case, the achievement of our land-grant mission. It accelerates our ability to impact education, healthcare, and prosperity. And if you have a, a culture that's challenged, it slows you down. It gets in the way of trying to accomplish what you're trying to do as an organization. I think we do all agree with that. And that's really the, that's the underlying premise as to why we think this is important and why we're trying to chase it is if we have a, a really strong culture, uh, we're able to get things done quicker. We're able to move faster as an organization. Uh, and so how we've tried to get after that through the initial survey that we've launched is just trying to identify cultural behaviors that we identify, we see. So there's over 20 cultural behaviors that are measured in this survey. And the first year that we did this, the real attempt was just to understand what is our culture? You know, if we didn't do this instrument, we said, what are we good at? What are we strong at? Versus what are the behaviors that hold us back? It would be 8,000 different opinions. This got us to the same page around what are the things we think we're good at versus where do we think the opportunities are? And so what we saw with that, if you take a look at the slide now that's up, um, things that really make our culture stand out, a strong sense of pride. And uh, for a lot of you, I know you're from uh, this area. Um, those of you who haven't, I know you've adopted West Virginia as a home. Uh, you know the pride here is, uh, it's everywhere, it's statewide. There's something really special, there's something emotional when you see that flying WV. That is uh, overwhelmingly our, our strongest strength in this culture is our pride in the state and our pride in the institution. Uh, the other thing that was really phenomenal is the fact that we are student focused. And I know there were, was a lot of effort, like when you talk about trying to shape a culture, 
uh, when Sharon Martin came on board, there was a lot of concerted effort around how do we get more student focused? How do we make sure we put students first? And you can see the result of that effort to try to shape that. It is you know, one of our top three strengths as a culture. And then the other thing we heard was people are fun to be around. In general, folks enjoy their coworkers. They enjoy the people they work with here at the university. But then when you talk about the concept of, okay, so what? You know, what why do we need to know the behaviors that hold us back? Um, these bottom things are what we heard in terms of these are things that slow us down. These are things that get in the way from a cultural standpoint, empowerment. Uh, we tend to be a top-down driven organization. We don't tend to share information or responsibility as well as we need to, and at times that holds us back. Coaching and feedback. Uh, one of the things we've found, and I will tell you now as I enter my third year here at the university, we're fairly conflict averse uh, when it comes to a lot of difficult discussions, and we see that quite a bit in terms of coaching and feedback. We'll tend to overlook a problem, walk around a problem, uh, work around a problem, and that slows us down as an organization. And then appreciation and recognition was another that we heard that we needed to get better around appreciation and recognition. So in that first year when we did this, um, what we really did was sampled about 2,000 folks, and the whole idea was just to get uh, the concept that we can measure the culture, we can start to get a kind of a common agenda and a common understanding of what are we good at and where can we improve things. Uh, but one of the pieces that uh, you know, we've learned from that is we can only impact so much in terms of central administration. And so I, I like to tell people it's about an 80-20 mix. The, the people you work with, the people you work for, uh, that drives about 80% of your experience here in your culture. If you hate the person you work for, there's not much we can do in terms of central administration. There's not, I can only pay you so much, I can only you know, give you so many perks, but if you have to deal with that person every day, sooner or later you don't like working here and you quit. And so what we've learned is that uh, you know, we can try everything we can from a central administration standpoint, but we're about 20% of the solution. And so what you see here is a lot of things we've done Centrally, we launched the Go Beyond Recognition Portal a couple of years ago. Prior to that, the only way you could do peer-to-peer -peer recognition here was in a manual program called uh, Climbing Higher. In a lot of cases, we had issues where people would get recognized and their supervisor didn't even know they got recognized. And you know, it was a well-intended effort, but we really had a hard time in terms of overall trying to make that come to life. So uh, we've had that in place now for about 18 months. Uh, we've got high utilization in some areas of campus, but not across the board to where we'd like to be. But we've upped the game in terms of recognition and appreciation compared to where we were two years ago. We implemented the Values Coin program as well. We're entering into, uh, you'll see this fall, we'll be going through the third iteration of that coin and we'll have a contest to actually design that logo. And it'll be designed by faculty and staff. Um, on the empowerment front, uh, if you, any of you have ever been to Campus Conversations, I know I recognize some faces in the audience from some of those that we've done. We've really dialed up the frequency of Campus Conversations. Uh, matter of fact, I did one of those uh, earlier today, but we're, we're out, uh, somebody from senior leadership just about every other week uh, doing a Campus Conversation, trying to increase transparency, trying to increase involvement. Um, and then if you look at our policy development process, where we've been since we got the, the freedoms that we got through the state uh, legislature. We've developed a completely new Board of Governors uh, policy development process and involved folks and made sure people have a voice in how we, we try to govern the university. Um, we've expanded the, the culture survey. So from year one, just doing that sample and trying to get people to understand this is the process and here's a way to start this dialogue. Uh, in year two, we had everyone in the university uh, it was extended an invite to participate to, again, hear everybody's voice in this process. Um, and then when you get to coaching and feedback, we've really changed quite a bit around what we do around leadership training. Uh, so when I got here, we had a, a program called Mountaineer Leadership Academy. Uh, it was an award-winning program. Nationally, we were picking up awards. And then when I went around and talked to deans and I talked to VPs, everybody said, I have a real problem here because my senior, my, my middle management, my frontline leaders don't know what to do. Um, we had a huge disconnect in terms of we had great content, but we had the wrong people in the room. Uh, and so we've redesigned that content, redesigned the approach, and really focused where most of the, the supervisors are and tried to meet them there. Um, and now we're trying to expand that program. But that's just an example, like when I talk about the 20%, those are some of the things we can do behind the scenes to try to, to move the culture forward. But the real dent comes when we start to talk about leadership and how we change things. Um, you know, where you live and we make it more local. Uh, but from 20, um, 
16 to 17, the, the next survey results, uh, we saw a little bit of a change. So this is once I, I said we expanded to all, uh, you know, roughly 8,000 uh, benefits eligible uh, folks here at the university, both faculty and staff. Uh, our strengths in terms of uh, pride and student focus stayed the same. But something that entered in that, that kind of nudged that fund to work with down the list a little bit was high expectations for performance. And if you think about what changed year over year in that time period, uh, the freedom agenda. So we got rid of bumping, we got rid of recall rights, we introduced performance as the main criteria for how pay is determined, we introduced performance for the main criteria around how we retain folks in jobs. That had a huge emphasis in terms of culture and how people view performance here, which was a good thing to the university. But then on the, the opportunities, one of the things that also crept in there you'll see is high performance is recognized and rewarded. The, the message we heard from folks is, okay, that's great. It's really important. There's a lot of pressure now on performance, but you're not differentiating rewards. You're not holding people accountable, and that's something you need to get better at. If we're, if performance is, we're truly going to be a performance-oriented culture, performance-oriented organization, then you need to put your money where your mouth is, and you need to act in, in alignment with that. So that, that's what we kind of learned um, in the next year. And uh, again, things that we've done around that, uh, we just had a, a campus conversation earlier today around compensation. Our compensation plans, what we did for fiscal year 18 and 19, a lot of what we did around decision making, how we came up with where we would spend that money and how would we, we would invest, came directly out of the, what we learned from the culture survey and what we needed to do different uh, around how we spent our compensation dollar. Another thing we've done differently, we've changed our new employee orientation. Um, you know, three years ago, it would be a scavenger hunt. Your first day, and some of you probably live this, you know, we'd send you the parking office, we'd send you the mountain layer, we'd send you down a waterfront, and, you know, hopefully you knew where all those places were and uh, you knew what you needed to do. And so the first thing we did was assembled all that together in year one uh, to where it was a one stop shop and waterfront. But now what we've done is we changed it from just a paperwork exercise to really talking about power of purpose. Uh, what are we trying to do as a university? What's our land grant mission? Uh, how do you tie into that, whether you're faculty or staff, and trying to make people understand that they're part of something much bigger and really talking about our values? We still get the paperwork done, but it's much more now around the culture and, and where we're trying to take the university. Um, the other thing we did, the big change year over year in these survey results, we provided individual results to senior leaders last year. And so some of you, like when I talk about these culture survey results, you've seen these, that's great. Some of you are looking at these things saying, why am I seeing this for the first time? Um, we put the deans and the VPs on the, the spot a little bit with this uh, in the fact that we want the leaders to carry the message. If you go back to that concept of 80-20, if the leaders aren't engaged and leaders don't own the results, there's only so much we can drive centrally. And so as, again, we try to move culture uh, one of the things we try to do is put the leaders in a different place uh, last year. Some have responded really well to that, and some have really struggled uh, with that. But again, we're evolving as we move forward. Uh, we've also had uh, a, a number of different developmental workshops, both for senior leaders um, as well as frontline leaders. And we've got some new processes that we're rolling out. You'll hear more about in the fall. I'm not going to go deep on those. Um, we've expanded Go Beyond across the WVU system. So initially, we rolled that out that was just here at main campus. <clears throat> That's now also at Beckley and Kaiser. And we uh, have rolled out an employee code of conduct as well to start to talk about how do, what do our values look like when we bring them to life, when we talk about behavior, uh, you know, what do those values look like behaviorally, and we talk with folks about that uh, day one when they, they start here. And so why I'm here today, what we wanted to talk about, that was all just kind of preface to, you know, what year three is about, right? So if you think about this, year one was just how do we measure culture? What, what are we good at? What are the behaviors that hold us back? Year two was around how do we get leaders to own this? How do we get leaders to start to carry it? Year three is about faculty. And so what we've learned so far, uh, you know, two years into this, this process is everything I've talked about right now is resonating with staff. It's working well with staff. I think we're going to see a, an improvement in results year over year on some of the, the bigger opportunity areas. But what we're hearing on faculty is, I don't get it. I think this is stupid. I don't understand how this relates to me and my role. Uh, and we're also hearing that from deans. That's pushback that they're getting from faculty when we say, why aren't you carrying the message? Why aren't you taking this forward? So what we're going to do about that, 
Uh, in October, November, Maria Mancini and I will be doing focus groups. We want to do faculty focus groups, and we want to hear from you all. Um, what could we do differently? You know, because the, the idea here again is there's only so much we can drive centrally, and a lot of it depends. Now that 80% is the the leaders, and then you all. You know, how do, how do we make this a better place to work? How do we make this a stronger culture? How do we start to eliminate some of the behaviors or uh, diminish some of the behaviors that hold us back as a culture? And I, I think, you know, if I, I asked everybody right now and I said, okay, do you feel like we're where we need to be? Should we just stop all of this work because culturally we're, we're right where we need to be as a university, we have a high performing culture. Is there anybody in the room that would say, yeah, Chris, we're, we're done? All right, we're, we're just beginning. And that's, you know, the main point with culture is it's a long game. It's going to take years to get this where it needs to be. And we're only about two and a half years into this experience. But the next thing we have to figure out is how do we make it more relevant for you? Uh, and how do we make it a tool that's useful to deans and to faculty? And so that's where we're going to try to go with your three. So a uh, couple of things just to make you aware of. The, the next survey is going to launch on the o o Monday, October 1st. You know, go through Monday, October 15th. And we've had roughly about a 54% participation rate from faculty in the last couple of years. Uh, I'd love to see it higher. And uh, the one thing that we've heard in prior years was, well, I'm worried about if I put anything negative on there, this may come back at me. So you know, want to make sure we debunk that. I, I do that every time I get up and talk about this. We've employed a, an outside firm. We don't get uh, anything other than the aggregate data. And we did that on purpose because we don't want to know the individual responses. We also don't have any write-in comments on there because we don't want to try to pinpoint any feedback. But what this does do is it holds us all accountable, particularly leadership holds us accountable. So we've been transparent. Uh, we share the results. And if you've seen some of those, when we put up the, the color charts, they're red, yellow, and green. There's a whole lot more red than there is green. So you know we're not really trying to to hide anything there, but we certainly would love to have a higher level of participation so we make sure we have everybody's voice. And what I would tell you is it's not going to come back to get you. We're, we're two years in. It hasn't come back to get anybody yet. It's not going to happen in year three either. So I really would encourage you to, to participate. Uh, and then the other biggie is just um, be on the lookout. In the, the next couple of months, we'll be doing those focus groups, and we'd love to have you. We'd love to hear your opinion and hear your feedback on how we can continue continue to do this and make it more relevant for our faculty audience. So with that, are there any questions from the group? Yes, ma'am. Can you use the microphone? Thanks. Hi, Chris. I'm Lori from the School of Public Health. Hi, Lori. Can you speak to your experience with um, culture surveys and DEI and whether or not most universities do those as separate assessments? and then whether or not you'll be doing a focus group on DEI, or whether or not we're including DEI on our culture survey. Yeah, so uh, this particular instrument is around uh, roughly 25 cultural behaviors and how much you observe or do not observe those cultural behaviors. Um, David Fryson and I, when we first went down this road, uh, took a look at uh, what he was doing around a DEI. Uh, kind of more of a climate survey. Um, when David looked at the questions on this, this instrument, they weren't specific enough for you know, things he was looking for. He, he wanted to drill down another level deeper. Uh, now that Misha's on board, we've gotten the questions to Misha. She's also doing that same review. Um, at this point, I think what we wind up with is the, the level of detail that Misha or David would want around inclusion uh, would be a couple of levels deeper than what we would have on this survey. So rather than try to make this survey fit, I think you're going to see us continue to have two. Uh, they'll have one that's much more focused around um, things they're trying to learn around DEI, uh, and, uh, and particularly the environment around inclusion, uh, than what we're going to be able to provide on this instrument. Yeah. Any other questions? Uh, so uh, David just asked faculty who want to participate in, in the focus groups, how will they do that? Uh, we'll be posting for those once we get them scheduled, get rooms located, everything like that, uh, and there'll be an open invitation. And so that's why today I wanted to just make
make you aware of that and plant that seed so you kind of understand what the, the background and the context is. But if you really have a passion for that, be on the lookout in the months of October and November. We'll be doing those around campus, and we'd love to hear what you have to say. Okay. All right. Thank you all very much. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, next up, uh, some Senate business. So we have to look at a curriculum committee report. Uh, so, employed. Hello, I'd like to present Annex 1 for approval. It is our committee's annual report from last year, as well as this year's upcoming goals. Okay. Uh, are there any objections or points of discussion for Annex 1, the committee report, and 1819 goals? Okay. My first vote. This is very exciting. All those in favor of accepting Annex 1, say aye. aye. All those opposed? WVU Tech, how do you vote? WVU Tech has three ayes. Thank you, ma'am. Potomac State, how do you vote? Potomac State has two ayes. Thank you, ma'am. The ayes have it. Annex 1 is accepted. Okay. Yeah, because I said approval, but it really is supposed to be accepted. Okay. All right, next up, uh, Robert Brock will present uh, an update on what the GEF committee has been up to. Not a whole heck of a lot. <laughs> <laughs> we have a meeting next week okay. where I can present okay. a lot more. So. <laughs> Fair enough. All right, here's where I'm going to uh, insert my item into the agenda. As noted, we have some new senators and even some old senators uh, who could probably use to be refreshed on what some of the Senate committees do. So I'm going to work randomly through a list of uh, chairs of various faculty senate and they can quickly come up to the microphones and sort of introduce themselves and sort of explain what it is their committees are up to and where necessary what they're up to for the next year. Uh, the point here is just so that you can attach uh, a name to a face and if you have any questions about what some of these committees are doing or any interest in what these folks are up to then you'll at least know who you're talking to when you send an email or buttonhole them at a, a senate meeting or something. Okay, so uh, why don't we start with Carolyn Atkins, uh, Committee on Committees. Well, my committee populates all the other committees. And that's exciting because there was a time many years ago when I was a new senator where we were strongly encouraged to participate in at least two committees. And then there was a time when we didn't have a lot of participation, but I'm happy to say we're back, and, and we thank you for that. We send out a survey in the spring of the year to all faculty asking what committees you would be interested in serving on, and then from that we try to have a balance of different representations, junior and senior faculty, Senate and non-Senators on the committees. So typically, that is our busy time of year. We encourage you, if you're interested, to certainly let us know that on that survey, to tell your colleagues that. And as time goes on, if we feel that a committee takes on extra duties and needs more membership, then we include new members on that. And we work in concert with the Senate chair and the executive committee. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Kim, can I come get you to come back up here? And sorry to make you run around. So I'm Kim Floyd from the Curriculum Committee, and by the name of our committee, we work all things curriculum. And so we are very fortunate that we have um, Misty and Sean from the Registrar's Office, and people from Lou's Office that love all things curriculum and assessment related. So um, if you have new courses, course changes, deletions, new minors, new majors, um, we're the folks that you need to reach out to. And this year, Misty's group at the registrar's office has started a workflow process that will be posted. We're getting feedback on it now. 
that gives deadlines where it needs to be for approval at your department, your college, at the Senate, and then, I mean, at our committee and then here at the Senate to kind of help people know not only the process but the deadline dates. Okay. Thank you, Moxley. Uh, next up would be Scott Wayne with Faculty Welfare. All right, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Scott Wayne from Statler College, chair of the Faculty Welfare Committee. Our committee deals with all issues that are of interest, uh, needs, uh, complaints from the faculty at large. Uh, we deal with uh, a lot of things uh, cultural related. Um, the uh, faculty and staff tuitions benefit that rolled out recently originated in our committee. Uh, the smoking policy is a, a topic that has come up again. Um, the faculty ombuds office was one of the uh, um, uh, originated in our committee. Uh, parking, those kinds of issues. Um, so you can re reach out to me if you have any concerns. Uh, also, the feedback button on the faculty uh, senate welfare as uh, a faculty senate page uh, comes to our committee. So that's another way to get in touch with us. Well, that's where that goes. Okay. All right. Uh, next up, Robert Brock. Yes. I'm Rob Brock. Yes. <laughs> um, I am the chair of the Jeff Co. Committee, which is General Education Foundation's Curriculum Oversight Committee. Ah. And uh, our task is to take already accepted curriculum courses that want to be aligned with general education to be assigned to a specific education core or, or um, trying to think of the focus word. Area. Pardon me? Focus area. Focus area, yes. Leap focus area. Um, I don't know. I guess that's about it. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Thank you, sir. Uh, next up, I'll ask Nick Bowman to talk about both the committees that he's running, the Research and Scholarship and the Library Committee. Good afternoon. I need to say mo no more often, but I didn't this time. Uh, really quickly, the Research and Scholarship Committee, our primary ch uh, charge is to kind of help understand and cultivate a, a culture of research for an R1 university. But I think the most hands-on work that we do are the internal faculty senate grants, both for the travel grants, which you can apply now for. So you don't have to wait till you get your approvals. We, we, um, you can apply for those through WUKC right now. And the uh, seed and scholarship grants in the spring were the body that evaluates and eventually awards um, those funds um, according to how much money we have that year. And for the library committee, um, broadly we, we sort of liaise between the library staff and the faculty to kind of help match needs. A big motion this year is going to be working on open access materials. So you're going to see a lot of information about open access week, about the online repositories and things like that. So I think you're going to see a little more action than normal out of that group because there's a lot of things happening with Karen Diaz's office. And you can email me for either one. Just make it clear which one you're yelling at me about and I'll answer it. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, next up would be John Connors with the Research Integrity Committee. Fair enough. Uh, and next up, uh, Karen Haynes, Service Committee. Karen Haynes, Communication Sciences and Disorders, and, and I'm chair of the Service Committee. We handle the service grants. So the all of the individuals who apply for service grants, we review those, and then we're able to distribute that money. So if you have a project in mind and would like to apply for a service grant, I would encourage you to do that. Those actually are in the spring and we'll be happy to take a look at them. Okay, thank you. And last up would be Ashley Martucci with the Teaching and Assessment Committee. Also known as the TACO Committee and we don't have tacos at our meeting, although we could do that. So you never know. Um, in, in all honesty, we are working on reviewing section syllabi right now in the Kim system. Engineering has graciously um, agreed to work with us for this semester, and CDFS will be working with us in the spring semester. We also work with Lou in his office in all things assessment. Yeah. That's it. Okay. 
All right, so hopefully, uh, as noted, a lot of the work of the Senate happens in the committees as opposed to the Senate itself. For those of you who have uh, interest in any of those areas or questions in any of those areas, hopefully this allows you to put a name with a face uh, if you need to follow up on anything. All right, next up on the agenda, we have some changes to some of the committee membership. Uh, there's some additional senators uh, and faculty members that have indicated they wish to serve on some of the Senate committees. Uh, so Annex 2 lists the faculty members and the committees that they will be assigned to. Uh, since the Senate sets the membership of the committees, we needed a formal vote to authorize uh, the additions to the committees. Since this item has been recommended for approval by the Executive Committee, an additional motion and second are not required, or so the previous parliamentarian told me. Uh, are there any objections or points of discussion Discussion for Annex 2. Okay, all those in favor of approving Annex 2 say aye. aye. All those opposed? Uh, WVU Tech, how do you vote? WVU Tech has three ayes. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Potomac State, how do you vote? Potomac State has two ayes. Thank you, ma'am. The ayes have it. Annex 2 is approved. Okay, next up, we have a report, a report from Roy Nutter from the faculty representative to the state government. Uh, Roy Nutter, Statler College. And I call myself the ACF rep, but the Senate calls it the liaison to state government. Neither of which is probably very descriptive, but at any rate. Uh, ACF, the Advisory Council of Faculty, is a representative statewide with uh, one representative from each of our state two-year and four-year schools, uh, including Potomac State and WBU Beckley. The, we met on um, August the 24th, I think it was, I don't see it on my notes here, uh, I also attended the HEPC meeting in the morning, and this kind of follows that. The, um, they discussed a number of things. The, uh, the one that I think is probably the most important was we had a presentation from uh, HEPC on the budget algorithm proposal, and frankly, it got my blood pressure really up. And I thought I was pretty cool with letting President Gee handle that. I still need to do that. But this thing's a mess, people. I, I don't know how to describe it more than that, more strongly than that. And I could probably talk for another hour. So let's not do that. One other thing that came up during that meeting is um, HEPC's Series 22, which I think we should be aware of although I don't believe it affects us, but their Series 22's DF repeat rule, and this is different. Uh, essentially, it limits DF repeats to uh, 21 credit hours, which sounds okay, except you can do a DF repeat under this rule for any time during the two-year program or four-year program. So you can do a DF repeat as a senior if you want to. In addition, under the new policy, students at four-year institutions can repeat up to 21 credit hours of coursework at any point before graduation, and if they're an upper division student, uh, they can repeat a C and replace that with a higher grade. That affects all two-year schools and four-year schools, I'm presuming, except WVU and Marshall. It's interesting that we need to think about how those are going to transfer. It seems like that doesn't seem right to me. So I put that out. Let's see what else we got going on. A report from the... Oh, one other thing here was there was some concern about the welfare of the Advisory Council classified employees as to whether that will still exist in a year or so. And that seems to be um, ongoing discussion. It looks like a lot of schools either have no classified employees now or soon will not. 
my report, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Questions? All right, next up, we have a report on the Board of Governors from Stan Heilman. All right, so the Board of Governors met a little while ago, June 22nd, and did a number of things at the end of the year academic year meeting. One was to approve the 2019 university budget. The other was to approve Rule 5.1, which dealt with authorization and delegation of authority for financial and administrative matters. We also approved for comment rules 5.2 to 5.4. Um, those have been commented on and they will actually come up for approval at the very next Board of Governors meeting. Uh, we discussed and approved moving forward with the new dorm, which is uh, supposed to be built at the Beckley campus. And we had a little bit of turnover on the board. Uh, Blake Humphrey, who was the former SGA president, uh, of course, I think is now in law school this semester, done a wonderful job. He is to be replaced by Isaac Obiama, who's the new SGA president. Uh, Tom Flaherty will also reach the end of his term limit, will remain until the uh, governor appoints a new uh, individual in his place. And if you know Tom, he's been a wonderful uh, person to have on the board of governors. And then finally, the next meeting will actually be coming up in a little less than two weeks on September 21st. Okay. Any questions for Stan? Okay. Thank you, sir. Next up on the agenda, a for information item. C.B. Wilson will talk a bit about the new policy on background checks. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as you know, we circulated the draft policy and a series of frequently asked questions uh, to you for your review. So at this point, uh, my main purpose today is to take comments and thoughts and so on. Uh, before we get to that, I think that the documents are pretty self-explanatory. Uh, I can share with you also that uh, these uh, the documents have been reviewed by what I would call our rules team, which is the group that worked with me as we were uh, developing the new Board of Governors faculty rules. Uh, we've also shared this with uh, department chairs at the chair symposium this past summer, uh, obviously with Senate exec uh, at the immediate previous meeting. We've also gotten input from deans at the last meeting of deans only. And what is yet to come is a uh, conversation with the Provost Council and then back to the Board of Governors for any updates that they might, uh, might have. So uh, at this point, um, I'd be happy to have your comments or questions if you have them. Here comes one. Hi, CB. Uh, Amy Hessel from the Everly College. Um, I had a question posed to me about this um, policy. They wanted to know how this would affect um, prospective grad students from other countries where it would be really difficult to get this sort of information. Okay, we've actually had a conversation about the general topic of graduate assistance as well as more specifically those who are foreign nationals. And we recognize particularly that sometimes those uh, uh, appointments are made relatively late. Uh, so I think lurking in the uh, language here are, is some uh, flexibility that uh, we could appoint uh, some of those individuals while the background checks are in place if that was warranted. I know that uh, obviously for uh, students from foreign countries that that might be a little bit more complicated. So we're, we're tuned into that. Thank you. Thank you. Roy. Uh, Roy Nutter, Statler College. I have about 40 questions here. <laughs> Shut up, I know. <laughs> uh, well, I, gee, how much time do we have? Well, probably not enough, but okay. let, me get, let me hit some of the top ones. Okay. I've read this in um, pretty, pretty detail, and it says WVU background check. Does this mean criminal background check and only criminal background check? Well, I think there's language particularly, actually both in the policy document and in 
the frequently asked questions that addresses exactly normally what would be looked at. Part of it is a criminal background check. All right, uh, so I, I can read you that paragraph if you would like. Well, I have read it, <laughs> and I have some more for you that relates to this, okay. uh, such as uh, credit check. That's not on the original list, but it would depend on what the position uh, that we were looking at uh, would require. Social media? I don't think we've gotten into that, no. Property records? Uh, if these are not on that list, as far as I know, the answer would be no. Yeah. Background? Yeah, I get that. It's a uh, generic term. Verification of previous employment? I'm looking at my friend here, Chris, and he's nodding yes, so. It's not in there. All right. We better put that in there. <laughs> Health records? Well, my guess is with HIPAA, probably not. Mental health records? Dental health? Mental health records. That's Mental. a health record. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Okay. I may not have any, but... <laughs> All right. Uh, we, we are going to require a very close attention to articulation of speech. <laughs> <laughs> Firearms check? Uh, as far as I know, if they're not on the list, it's a no, but why don't you send me that list and then I'll, I'll try to, to respond to it. Bank okay. information? These are all things that I talked with our state police guys, of course, and I said, okay, you guys do background checks. What do you do? This is the list. Now, health records, probably not, but I don't know what they do with the mental health records. Um, and then it, I guess it evolves from that point to um, where does the data go? And you said a third party in here somewhere, an unnamed third party, so I assume a contractor. That's correct, that, they, they, that individuals will get a link to contact that third party uh, contractor directly and uh, fill out whatever forms they have. So what assurance do we have of the security of that information? Um, I've not actually asked that question. Chris, can you help me with that? Uh, you, you can come here. I sure. won't let you. <laughs> so, um, and again, I, I'll, I'll just. I, I should add that we do this routinely now for all staff. Okay, so what we're adding is the faculty group or many in the faculty group who are not presently subject to background checks. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just clarify too, I've not been a part of this committee, but you know, again, this is sort of my bailiwick in terms of what, what I do for a living. So uh, in general, the, the spirit and intent behind anything like this is what we're trying to identify is, is the applicant who they say they really are, right? So you are gonna look at things like, um, you know, the, their job history, is it, if they say I have a degree and I've worked in these places, have they really done that? Or have they made that up creatively on their resume or their, their CV? Uh, the other thing we're gonna look for is are they a danger to us or any of our students? Because we're liable for that if we introduce them into this environment. And you know, if you remember what people said about Ted Bundy, he was the guy next door and you know, you, you never really know who you're dealing with and that's where the, you look for that data. Um, I would presume at this point you haven't put anything out to bid for contractor, correct? We're going to use the present contractor. Okay, so in our, our current agreement, we, they, we would have uh, stipulations. Now, I, I can't cite those for you chapter and verse, but we could find those around data security and what the, the vendor is liable for. But these are folks that this is what they do for a living. Uh, and, you know, data security is not something they're going to take lightly because, again, you know, if you, you think about identity theft, and, I mean, these folks are dealing with every little bit around your social security number and where you've been and what your history is. So, uh, you know, this is not uh, one of those situations where you're going to go in and folks don't have protocols in place and protections in place. And in this case, if we're going to use our existing vendor, 
and I hate to even say it because the minute you say it, something happens, but uh, we haven't had any data breaches. We haven't had any concerns in the, the duration of time we've worked with that vendor. Your next question would probably be, well, how long has that been? Again, I'd have to find that out for you. I don't know off the top of my head. So I don't know if that's helpful or? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and actually, I'd be happy to have that list and we'll try to uh, probe that and square it away. I'll send it to you. Thank you. Part of my business that I do is cybersecurity. This scares the crap out of me. This, this, we really need checks here that I'm not sure you thought about. Let me just, one thing I would add to that is that if you look at what we checked today, right, on that, because this is pretty much faculty side we're talking about, what checks do we do today? Right now, uh, for some faculty, uh, the units have, uh, for instance, in uh, health sciences, many of those folks are already undergoing background checks. But there are other folks that we do nothing? That's correct. Fair to say? I'm more afraid of the fact that today we do nothing. Um, and so we might not have an all-encompassing list to hit everything that you've got on your sheet, but uh, it's a start compared to where we are. Uh, there are some things, though, again, when you look at reasonableness around the job, uh, we're, we're not going to be able to look at the property records and firearms and, um, you know, all of the, the health records, all of those kind of things for a variety of reasons. One, we have to prove it's job-related as we use it to make a decision. Uh, and the other thing you have to think about is practicality of if we went as, on as exhaustive of a list as you have there, um, again, depending on the position, maybe a, a top secret security clearance, something like that, you get that level of thorough, uh, but it adds a lot of time to any hire you're going to make. And so there's also a practical nature of, um, you know, what can the industry generally turn around in a quick window of time? And today, the, the folks that are really good at this can turn something around, and it's usually less than one work week. They're able to turn back around what we're looking for in terms of criminal history and you know, employment verification, those kind of things. I, I would relinquish my time with, with the idea that I can come back. <laughs> okay. Come here. You could. I was just going to add that I think a lot of this came from a case of fraud that we had in the Health Sciences Center, and the issue was, are you who you say you are? And so since then, we've all had to go back and prove that we actually have the degree that we say that we have. And before, we just depended on people's CV. So, so I think that kind of was the spirit of what this is all about. So um, everybody at the health sciences is doing that now. And I'm glad. I mean, this can happen at any university, but we're just trying to put in preventive procedures so that it doesn't happen again. Thank you. Maybe one more, maybe two more, maybe five more. Okay. Uh, talks about adverse action. This is, uh, see if I can quote it for you. WVU talent and culture will notify their prospective or current employee if information obtained from the background check may be used. I don't understand the may. In whole or in part, in the decision to deny employment or as a basis quote, for any adverse employment action. And I look up adverse action means method WVU outlines the reasoning as to why an applicant may not be hired. So I'm not sure what determines an adverse action. I'm not sure what determines whether we hire or not. An example would be a uh, few years ago, and I think it was Penn State probably, I, I don't really remember the school, but it came out that one of the history professors who had been there for many, many years, like 20 years, was a convicted felon for murder. But he'd been in prison, he'd served his time, he was out, got a PhD and was teaching. You know, what parts of these things that we're doing here, how does it affect it? I mean. Would we accept somebody like that or not? It's not necessarily a question. It's something I need that you need to think about. At what what level do you say no? We're not going to do this, and who makes that decision? In my discussions with our state police friends, I said, "Who makes a decision when you hire a state police officer after a quote background check?" And they said they have a 
selection board of police officers who all look through it, and then it's passed up with a decision at a higher level, and then the colonel, who's the very highest, makes the final decision. So it's not just an unknown group, it's a known group. And I guess that gives me a little bit of concern about what we're doing here. Even though it may be in talent and culture, to me they appear unknown. They're just, I don't know who they are, I don't know what criteria they're using. It seems like that ought to be a little, little more public than it seems to be. With that, thank you, sir. Okay. Okay. Other thoughts? I got, I got one for you. Okay. Uh, just a process question. Because you expect this to go into place by the spring semester. It would be for, uh, the way I understand it, it would be for hires that would be starting in the, set, uh, okay. in the spring semester. And the majority of these will be graduate students because they all get hired on that basis. I presume. So, uh, as you said, uh, there will be a, a process to make an exception if, the, if they take too long to do. What is that process? In other words, should they email you? Should they email your office? Should they email the provost? If I'm a faculty member and I want to hire somebody and it's taking too long and, and we're up against the deadline, what do they actually do come down? Well, for lack of a very specific plan right now, I would say let me know and we'll try to work that out in advance as well. Yeah. Okay. This will also be applying to the uh, regional campuses. Are there any questions from Tech? No questions. And apparently that's also true for Potomac State. Single answer. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, I know we're, we're pushing on time here, but we've got one more uh, major uh, uh, thing to push through here. Uh, we're going to attempt to amend the Constitution. Uh, a working group of some of the Senate leadership, uh, Matt Valenti, uh, Stan Heilman, Emily, Chad, uh, me, and, and, and Judy, as all was helping, worked over the summer to uh, propose some changes to the faculty constitution. The primary purpose of these changes uh, is to make the constitution consistent with the Board of Governors rules and policies that changed in the last year, where the old constitution made reference to Hep C, for example. We needed to adjust to uh, make reference to the Board of Governors rules as appropriate. Uh, beyond those updates, we made a few what we consider relatively minor changes uh, to try to just update the spirit of the Constitution and make it run more efficiently. Uh, we don't think these changes are substantive in terms of the operation of the Senate or, or its committees. The changes themselves are in Annex 3 with Annex 4, which is what I've got here on the screen and I can, I can page down slowly here in a second, uh, is sort of an overview of what those changes do. Uh, procedurally, uh, only the faculty assembly meeting, uh, which is meeting next month as part of the State of the Uni University address uh, from President Guy, can change the Constitution itself, but the Senate has to vote to send the proposed changes to the full faculty assembly. Uh, our uh, Chad Pradfoot, our parliamentarian, has advised me that the Senate can only vote to amend or reject what the Senate Executive Committee approved as proposed amendments. So what this means is that if you don't like any of the things that we are proposing, you can uh, motion at this point to take those out. You cannot at this point motion to make amendments. In other words, you can line item veto the things that we have recommended to change. So you can prevent those changes from taking place, but the Senate itself at this point cannot actually make additional or, uh, or different changes that we have put forward. Uh, and given the faculty uh, assembly only meets once a year, uh, this needs to be voted on today in order to go to the faculty assembly next month. Uh, finally, note that amending the Constitution will require an affirmative vote by two-thirds of the voting senators, which requires us to actually count the vote. Uh, so I'll be asking you to raise your hands in favor and then opposed, and please keep them up while we count the vote to make sure we have the sufficient numbers. Okay, and I will quickly go through this uh, uh, so that you can sort of see what the uh, changes were uh, that we uh, did here. Ooh, come on. 
So again, number one was just updating to the definition of the Board of Governors rules. Uh, we, uh, in an attempt to expand the, the, the membership of the Senate to encourage more people to participate, we formally made committee chairs and Senate officers uh, are automatically made actually members of the Senate. Uh, we capped the size of the constituency, so it would be just under what is necessary for a quorum. So in theory, no particular constituency can take over the Senate. Uh, maybe folks will like this or not, but we actually took away the necessity for having a June meeting. So June meeting now becomes optional based on what it is that we need to accomplish in any given year. Uh, we also made sure that the, both the president and the provost uh, have the right to address the Senate. They're not made members of the Senate, but they always have the right to address the Senate as necessary. Uh, in an attempt to do something about uh, uh, attendance, uh, we noted that uh, senators that fail to attend at least one meeting per academic uh, semester can be removed from the Senate, not must be, but at least can be removed from the Senate. Uh, the executive committee can add standing committee chairs to its membership, so the executive committee can invite chairs of some of the standing committees to come to and participate in the executive committee, so again, uh, encouraging the flow of information. Uh, and again, uh, part of sort of opening up the Senate, the chairs of the standing committees can either be present senators, have to be chair elects the previous year, the chair elects uh, uh, can be senators, or just members of the committee. So they don't actually have to be senators, just as long as they're members of the committee for at least three years ahead of time, then they can be chair elects and then can be chairs as well, at which point they would be senators. Uh, uh, the each Senate committee is allowed to determine the voting status of their own ex officio members, so both faculty and administration officials who are commonly coming to those meetings could be allowed to vote on what happens within those committees. Uh, it also allows you to kick me out if I fail to do the, my appropriate duties for two, uh, two consecutive months uh, and allows for the specific uh, process by which members of the Senate can be removed by Senate vote. Uh, allows the faculty secretary to determine how to fill vacant seats. Mostly we go down the list for the next highest vote getter and appoint those people into the faculty uh, senate. Sometimes there isn't anyone else on the list of voting, so this allows the secretary to determine what's an appropriate way to appoint people into the senate. And then finally, as noted, updates the language to be consistent with, uh, with HEPC as opposed to BOG. So again, the actual changes are Annex 3. This was just the overview of, of what we're doing here. Uh, that was a long preamble, but are there any objections or points of discussion for Annex 3, the proposed changes to the Senate Constitution? Uh, Nick Bowman, Everly College. I just have one question about point 9. Um, I wonder if some people might wonder if that effectively takes away the ex officio label if you make somebody a voting member of a committee, or what was the impetus behind adding that one? So it doesn't make them voting members, it allows right. the committee itself to determine whether they want to allow them to vote or not. Right, so I'm wondering um, the logic behind that. So uh, yeah. again, I come from the, the GEF side of things uh, and some other stuff. We've had a number of administration folks in the committees for long periods right. of time, and given their knowledge base, it just seemed to some of us that it would make sense that it would be at least an option we would consider to allow them to vote. Uh, or even student members or something like that. So again, the, the point isn't to, to force the changes. The, f the point is to allow each committee to make its own determination about who should appropriately vote on the issues that come before that committee. Especially, as you know, a lot yeah. of the committee action just gets come through the Senate straightforwardly. Right. It made sense to let the committees, we thought, uh, make their own decisions about doing these things. That's the only question I have. The other ones seem pretty clear to me. Sure, no problem. Uh, Ilkin Belgisi with Statler. I have two comments, uh, one to follow up on that comment. Uh, if, if the committee is going to decide uh, ex officio to vote, so alternately this can be voting member or the alternate year it may be non-voting member, so we have a, not the precedence, but it will be changing for the committee from year to year if the committee decides to do so. Is that correct understanding of that? Yes, that's my understanding is that, like I said, the committee on a year-by-year -year basis can decide who it is they want to allow to, to vote so they can make changes to the, the, the status, the voting right. status of the ex officio. Yeah, members. I understand it, but what I meant was like a committee may have voting members one year and non-voting members the other year, so it may be confusing. It could be. A second comment I have is that the way I understand here at any given time, the committee uh, 
constitution will be saying that uh, members can be non-senators, all of them can be non-senators according to this statement. Is that right? Uh, no, my understanding is that committee membership is usually determined by the committee on committees, uh, and there's a ratio of Senate members to non-Senate members. Yes. And, and, and the committee would then determine in the case, even non-Senate members have voting rights. Uh, the, the question is ex officio members and what their voting rights would be. Well, that's a different thing, but it says here that other committee members need not to be members of the Senate. Correct. So that means any committee work can be done with non-Senators. Yes. Okay. Are there any additional questions or points of discussion? Are there any questions from the branch campuses? Okay. Okay, I've been advised. Are there any motions to strike any of the proposed changes? Good enough. Okay, then, uh, since this item has been recommended for approval by the executive committee, an additional motion and second are not required at this point. However, it will only pass if two thirds of those voting members affirm that they want it to pass. So, those in favor of the slate of proposed constitutional changes, uh, please raise your hand and keep them in the air while we do the count. missed an opportunity here. I should have had the Jeopardy theme music keyed up. Are we good? Okay. Those opposed, please raise your hand. Okay, WVU Tech, how do you vote? You want hands? You, you, <laughs> you can just tell us. Okay, three eyes. Thank you, ma'am. Potomac State, how do you vote? Two eyes. Thank you, folks. Okay, I believe the motion carries, so this will move on to the faculty assembly next month. All right, thank you for your forbearance on that one. Item 14, new business. Is there any new business? Lori Andra, School of Public Health. I read through the Constitution rather quickly. I'll admit that first. There may be something I misread. I noticed in the, one of the sections it addressed creating a new committee. And it said the city, the Senate may create a new committee. Is there more to it than that? How do you create a new committee? Um, I think it probably has to go through, I don't know, through exec probably. We changed the charter for TACO and we created TACO too. So it probably needs to be voted on in exec and then come to Senate to also be voted on. But, but I can, right. So I will happily look that up and make sure you get that information to find out the, 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 the process for doing so. But, but like I said, as far as I know, it needs to be authorized by the Senate, but that's a straightforward vote to do so. Okay, no problem. Any other new business? Okay, do I have a motion to adjourn? Second. All right, thank y'all. <laughs>